Good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7 here on Broadcasting Scotland. My name's Kenny McBride and I'm joined this evening by two excellent guests. Firstly, I'm joined by Rural Leader Day Tucker. Day, how are you doing this evening? I'm very well, thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be back on the show with you. And on the other side of me, from the SNP Socialist Group, we have Chris McCusker. Chris, how are you doing this evening? I'm fine, Kenny, despite being on the right. Uh, <laughs> uh, You're on my left, Chris, so that's something. <laughs> uh, but oh, we, we'll move on and uh, start this evening, as we always do, with our coronavirus update. And as of 2pm today, a total of 1,233,089 people in Scotland have been tested through NHS Scotland Labs and UK Government Regional Testing Centres. Of these, 1,131,614 were confirmed negative, 101,475 were positive. There were 692 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Scotland today, and sadly, there were 33 new reported deaths. Of course, this will be an underestimate of the total number of cases, as not everyone with the virus will show symptoms and not everyone will necessarily get themselves tested. As always, we urge you, if you are showing symptoms of a new dry persistent cough, a fever or a change in your sense of taste or smell, then do please go to test as soon as you can. Also, if you're in one of the areas doing community testing, then please look into that if you can as well. Of the people who have tested positive, there were 983 people in hospital last night, 57 of whom were in intensive care. And the number of patients in Scotland who have died from complications caused by the coronavirus infection now stands at 3,950. This number only includes those who have died in hospital having received a positive test for the virus. And the latest UK daily figures published today show that 62,033 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died from their illness, an increase of 616 since yesterday. This number refers to deaths in all settings, not just those in hospitals. And we also have the latest report from the Office for National Statistics covering COVID-related deaths in England and Wales for the week ending the 27th of November, which was week 48 of the year. In that week, there were 3,040 deaths registered where the novel coronavirus was mentioned on the death certificate. This is an increase of 343 from the previous week. However, it is worth noting that deaths in Wales fell by five from the previous week, meaning the increase in England was 348, or almost 15%. UK government daily reporting had counted 3,133 deaths in England and Wales in that week, 93 more than the number announced today. A total of 66,907 deaths have been registered in England and Wales since the beginning of the pandemic up to November the 27th. And before we go on with the rest of today's headlines, if you would like to join the conversation here, you can do so on Twitter by following us at Broadcast Scott and using the hashtag Scotland at seven. And as you can see, we will be flashing some of those tweets up on the screen throughout the show. So please do get in touch if you've got something to say about any of our stories tonight. But in our first story, senior charge nurse Andrew Menchnarowski was one of the first vaccinators in Scotland to receive the coronavirus vaccine at NHS Lothian's Western General Hospital today. Asked about receiving the vaccine, he said, It's very exciting. It's the first time a major vaccine has come through so quickly. So to be part of that is amazing. He went on to say that he was feeling fine with no pain in his arm. The nurse said he would carry on as normal and that having had the first one, the second dose would be a walk in the park. Talking about his colleagues being part of the first phase of vaccinations in Scotland, Mr Menchnarowski said, I think the whole of the Western are very proud of what they have done throughout the whole of the COVID epidemic and today just marks that next step forward in the battle against it. So Day, um, this is good news isn't it to see this vaccine finally reaching, albeit a fairly small group, but it is now on the way and uh, we can see some, some kind of light at the end of the tunnel now. Yes, absolutely. It's particularly good news for those who are actually getting the, the vaccination. Um, but uh, as the First Minister keeps telling us, it's not a time for us to think that it's all over because it isn't all over. And we need to keep 
um, putting in place the measures to protect ourselves and others, washing our hands and keeping a space between us and all that sort of thing. And I was particularly struck by um, two images that came on Twitter last night. One was of London, one of the big Oxford Street, I think, which was absolutely seething with people. And the other was Sucky Hall Street or Argyle Street in Glasgow, which was absolutely empty. Now, I know that perhaps they were taken at different times, but I do think that up here we have taken keeping space and distance between ourselves much more seriously than they appear to be doing down south. Mm. And Chris, to come to you on this, uh, obviously it's it's these people who are giving the vaccine that are getting the, the first doses. Um, that's really welcome, isn't it, for NHS workers to know that they are going to be protected? Well, I, th I actually think that it's in stark contrast, uh, if I may uh, point this out, uh, to uh, the announcement, the way that the... Uh, shall we say, the right-wing media uh, t down in uh, England uh, reported it. Uh, they went out their way to, you, you know, it was a 90-year-old woman uh, who was in a care home. And then the, the uh, next chap uh, to get it was, you, you know, would you would you believe it, uh, someone called William Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, and it just happened to be from Stratford-upon-Avon, by all chances. Uh, and... You, you, you know, I just find it found it a bit crass uh, that you, you you know that they would go that length in order to sort of like uh, uh, herald it. You, you know, you know, let Trump it in. I mean, obviously these people have been selected, uh, and uh, they you, you know that's. I just find it really mm, a bit suspect the fact that you know it was uh, 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 you, you know. Slightly contrived, to say the least, mm. uh, and I was I was heartened to see that uh, the, the uh, uh, first person to get it in Scotland was actually a, a health worker. So, mm -hmm. you know, from that point of view, it's uh, got to be welcome. Absolutely, yeah, and I'm sure we're all impressed with Matt Hancock's contribution to the onion chopping industry today. Uh, but we move on. Um, more than 2 million people who have been living under the strictest COVID-19 protection levels for three weeks will have restrictions eased this Friday. This follows improvement in the number of new cases in recent weeks in the 11 level four local authority areas, which are now due to drop down to level three. Overall, half of all Scotland's local authorities will move down a level this coming Friday. The First Minister told Parliament today, the fall in infection rates in these areas, the most highly populated in the country, have contributed to an improvement in the situation across Scotland as a whole. All of this puts us in a much better position to cope with the inevitable difficulties of winter. However, it does not remove the need for a cautious approach. The risks and challenges of the next few months are clear. The First Minister stressed that travel restrictions remain in place and no one in a Level 3 area or, until Friday, a Level 4 area should travel outside their local authority area except for essential purposes. So just quickly, we'll run down what those levels are going to be as of Friday. So level one will include Highland, Murray, the Western Isles, Orkney, Shetland, Borders and Dumfries and Galloway. Level two is Aberdeenshire, Aberdeen, Argyll and Butte, Angus, Inverclyde and Falkirk. And in level three, Fife, Perth and Kinross, Eastern Bartonshire, Western Bartonshire, Renfrewshire, East Renfrewshire, the City of Glasgow, South Ayrshire, East Ayrshire and North Ayrshire, Stirling, Clackmannanshire, City of Edinburgh, Midlothian, West Lothian, East Lothian, Dundee and North and South Lanarkshire. Uh, if you didn't catch that, you can of course use the postcode checker on the Scottish Government website to find out the rules in your area. But Day, um, obviously this will be welcome to, to people who have been living under these level four restrictions, that it's now safe enough that we can start to to move in a in the direction of loosening the restrictions isn't it oh absolutely yes because it, i mean clearly people are very very tired and exhausted and, and want this whole thing to be over and at the same time they don't expect it to be over but the frustration's still there and the temptation i suppose is to try and 
see people as much as possible. Um, those of us who are lucky to, enough to have enough technology where we can have Zoom meetings and speak to the family through all the various other mediums that there are, it, that's fine. But there must be vast swathes of people who don't have those kind of um, facilities. Uh, and it must be really, really hard for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, um, do you feel like this is uh, this is the right move? We are still obviously seeing relatively high levels of infection in Glasgow, uh, North Lanarkshire particularly, uh, have seen still quite high rates of infection. Do you think the, the Scottish Government has made the right decision in reducing this level instead of maybe just holding on for a week or two until this this break that we're having at Christmas? I th I, I've got mixed feelings about this, Kenny. Uh, I mean, I I personally, I can't still get to uh, go and see my partner. Uh, and uh, I think it's a softly, softly approach leading up to the uh, uh, five-day, dare I say, stay of execution for uh, Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what I do find uh, really bizarre is, well, well, it's not actually bizarre, uh, I, I find it uh, in total continuity is the fact that the First Minister is uh, saying that uh, even though the uh, tears are, are uh, dropping, uh, she's still advising against inter-council travel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yet we see uh, HRH uh, uh, jumping on a train and deciding to turn up in Edinburgh uh, you, you know, against the Scottish government's uh, express wishes, uh, and also done similar in Wales. Uh, and uh, what a signal is that sending out to uh, you, you know uh, people who are not uh, following the rules uh, strictly by the by the numbers, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that basically gives them carte blanche to do what they want. If the you know royal family are seem to be you know uh, quite happily hopping around the country and stuff like that, and in an exercise which is completely needless as uh, as far as I can see. Yeah, yeah, I'm sort of shocked at you I thinking think. that something the royals do is completely needless, Chris. Uh, we <laughs> wouldn't have expected that from you. Uh, we move on now, though, uh, to Brexit, and the UK and EU have made agreements on Northern Ireland but significant differences remain in the negotiations over a wider trade deal, with just hours to go before another deadline passes, and Boris Johnson again threatening to walk out on the talks. The Northern Ireland Protocol, which was one of the toughest points of negotiation in last year's withdrawal agreement discussions, governs how the Irish border is to be managed once the UK leaves all EU institutions and governance. The Good Friday Agreement requires the border to remain open, which means the UK government had to agree to border checks being introduced between the islands of Ireland and Great Britain. However, aspects of the UK Internal Market Bill threw the UK's commitment to the protocol into question. The matter now appears to be settled and the offending clauses in the bill are to be removed, but businesses in the North still say the government has not provided enough advice on how they will be affected. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson today told reporters that he would continue to seek a deal up until the last possible moment, but added that there may come a moment when we have to acknowledge that it's time to draw stumps and that's just the way it is. EU negotiators previously warned that Wednesday was the last possible day for a deal to be agreed if it was to have time to be ratified by all member states before the end of the year. Irish Foreign Minister Simon Coveney told legislators today that if something did not break in the talks very soon, then EU leaders would use their meetings on Thursday and Friday to begin rolling out their no-deal contingencies. So, Day, um, we have heard deadlines before. We've heard several deadlines before, in fact. Uh, but we are now just days away from the, the end of the year and still no deal in place, still no proper advice for the businesses that are affected. And we're still seeing this brinkmanship from both sides. Uh, how do you see this playing out over the next few days? Just the same. I don't think it'll be any different. It'll go on and on until it's finished. And it may not end in the next few days. Mm. It's, it's pathetic. And what do you think the, the, the end game of the, the UK government is? Do you think they have 
a, a belief that there is a deal that can be done, or do you think this is all just uh, playing for time in order to get to no deal? Uh, yes, I think it's. I think they they want to get to no deal, and I think they always have done. Oh. And Chris, what about you on this? Are you feeling any sort of confidence that a, a deal will be done at the last minute? Is is one of those things that we've we've seen many times with the EU that nothing seems like it's going to happen, and then very suddenly, right at the end, uh, something gets cooked up. Do you think that's going to happen uh, in the next week or so? I think uh, uh, a, a deal will be reached, right? And, and, and I put that in inverted commas, mm -hmm. a deal. Uh, to be honest with you, it will be the, uh, what the hell, it might be the last time that I'm on broadcast in Scotland. It's going to be the shittiest deal that we've ever going to, you, you know, uh, be able to have. Uh, and Boris Johnson will present it as the wedding cake when quite clearly everybody can see exactly what it is uh you you, you know uh and it'll be it'll honestly it'll be you you know dressed up as such uh that you you know the only thing is though so, uh, uh, we will have to accept it uh you, you know so honestly i can't stress enough uh, 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 it can be the crappiest deal ever, and yet Boris Johnson will present it as the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, and uh, you know, un un unfortunately, you, you know, we will have to, you know, take a bite out of that sandwich that it's going to get. You know, it's going to get made, uh, and you, you, we have no alternative to that. You, you know, and and what Scotland has to understand is that. May is a long way away, uh, you, you know, for Scotland to exercise its democratic right, uh, and uh, you know we'll be able to, you, you know, sort of like fight our corner again. Uh, but we can't do it until May, uh, you, you know, until we get a majority in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, so you, you know, we can only chip in from the sidelines. As I was watching the House of Commons this morning, uh, the uh, this afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, Alistair Thulis was battling on, uh, you, you know, with regards to internal taxations and stuff like that and all the rest of it, uh, you, you know, the wider question of the internal market. And, you, you know, they were just sitting there laughing at us. Mm -hmm. And she was so exasperated. Honestly, you could see the exasperation in her, in, in her demeanour and her speech. And you, you know, she was still trying to point out the obvious to these absolute baying clowns, mm. and you, you, they just don't see it. They've just got one thing in their mind, and that is, let's get the deal done. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you know, no matter if it's if it's if it's no deal, or as I say, a shitty deal, or you, you, you know, any other type of deal. That is exactly that. That that is their mantra in mm. their mind. As you you know, you know what they're going for. Uh, you, you know, whereas Alison was pointing out the fact that it doesn't have to be this way. Mm. Do, you, you know, and all throughout it, they have not uh, consulted with the, the uh, uh, devolved governments. Uh, you, you know, I mean, one of them had the audacity to stand up and say, you, you know. We respect the fact that Scotland didn't vote for breakfast, uh, uh, Brexit. We respect the fact that Northern Ireland didn't vote for Brexit. But at the end of the day, we are the UK and we will do what the majority mm. of the UK say. And we're, we're, we're sort of like, but you're still not getting it. Well, Chris, and that we... is the thing is, 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 is that the devolved competencies need to accept the fact that the uh, shit show is coming down the line and we're just going to have to deal with it and that's yeah. it well chris we are just uh coming to a story about that uh, the internal market bill that you mentioned there uh commenting on the uk government's decision to reinstate clauses in the internal market bill that would break international law and threaten devolution cabinet secretary for the constitution europe and external affairs michael russell said 
If the UK government had any shred of respect left for parliamentary process, this unprecedented, unnecessary and deeply damaging bill should have been scrapped. By the UK government's own admission, the internal market breaches international law and reneges on the withdrawal agreement. It also constitutes a significant threat to devolution and the democratic accountability of the Scottish Parliament. It beggars belief that UK government ministers are pressing ahead with this deeply flawed legislation despite the fact that it has been rejected comprehensively by both the Scottish Parliament and the House of Lords. Uh, and they, um, kind of what Chris was saying there, this uh, this has not received uh, legislative uh, support from the, the Scottish Parliament, legislative permission uh, from the Scottish Parliament. I think the Welsh Parliament has also uh, refused legislative consent. Uh, the Lords savaged the bill. Uh, lawyers have savaged the bill. Government lawyers resigned over this internal market bill. Uh, and still the UK government is determined to press ahead. What do you think that says about what the UK government's uh, intentions are? That, that they're just continuing to ignore the devolved government. And worse than that, they're actually blaming the SNP for these changes not getting through. So the, they, are, they are really the most low despicable MPs that we have ever seen. Um, it, 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 I'm, I'm just beyond words. Uh, the, you know, as, as Chris says, the way, the, I don't know how he could even sit through that program and watch the way that our M MSPs and indeed the Welsh ones have been treated, are being treated and will continue to be treated by the English MPs in that dreadful place. Mm. Now, obviously, this question of uh, the, the UK government being able to impose standards, this is something that would potentially affect you as a farmer. Um, and also when it comes to uh, farmers in Ireland, have you any friends uh, who, who are farmers in Ireland that are kind of in that position of not knowing what to expect come the end of December? Yeah, well, all of them. None mm. of them know what to expect. And, and what the British government, and indeed most farmers over here don't understand, is the flow of livestock that crosses the border from north to south on a regular daily basis. Um, I mean, you're talking thousands of, of animals going from north to south. So that's all going to be up in the air. Um, the uh, veterinary regulations are such that we're going to um, not be able to send livestock over there. Um, the other thing is that the uh, anybody, so quite a few farmers in Northern Ireland have bought livestock already um, from farms that do very thorough testing um, mm. before they're allowed into Northern Ireland, and yet they're not allowed in just now. Um, so they, they've lost out on that. They've spent the money on the, on these animals and yet they can't get them over there. Mm. Well, Chris, I'll turn to you now. And on the, the politics of this, um, the, the Tories, uh, obviously, in the last few years have talked more and more about their precious union, how the union is the most important thing in the world to them. And yet this internal market bill is such a slap in the face to devolution. Uh, we've seen the Labour Party in Wales furious about it, and they're, you know, ardent unionists. Um, we've obviously seen every party, bar the Tories in Scotland, furious about this. What do you think is the, the political goal of the Tories, and what do you think will be the effect on the... The, the popularity of the union in the devolved nations? Uh, I'll answer it in two parts, Kenny. Uh, the the uh, goal of the Conservative Party at this moment in time is centralisation. Uh, and and, and it's, as, it's as clear as that, it's as plain as that. Uh, they, they were against uh, devolution right from the start when it was brought in under uh, UK Labour, and uh, they have they have fought uh, against devolution ever since its inception. Uh, it doesn't suit them because uh, you know it obviously 
uh, it gives us uh, a wee bit more leeway, uh, and I say that a, a wee bit more leeway. The uh, second point uh, that, uh, that I have to make is the the oxymoron that's in the room is uh, similar to Scottish Labour and uh, uh, Welsh Labour, is the fact that, yes, they are diehard unionists, uh, but they are fervent uh, devolutionalists, mm. uh, which begs a question as to, you, you, you know, one one can obviously see the the uh, quandary in that party as to you, you know which way to turn uh, you, you know which which uh, 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 is uh, bigger is it the union or is it devolution uh, and uh, you, you know from my time and uh, spent at, uh, uh, living in wales and working in wales uh, they are, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, quite nationalistic uh, to the point of, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, some of them uh, speaking Welsh and all the rest of it. But when it comes down to it, as as the union above everything, and it is that unwillingness to get off their knees, uh, which absolutely befuddles me. Uh, and you, you know we bring that question up to Scotland, and we look at Richard Leonard, uh, and we see that uh, there's a chat of a possible uh, uh, leadership contest mm. brewing, uh, and uh, again, uh, you, you know he, he's uh, not enjoying, as far as I can understand, he's not enjoying the best of relations with Keir Starmer, uh, and uh, as again this this uh, question between unionism and devolution is as 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 the straw that is constantly breaking scottish labor's back uh and also labor's back to be fair uh because you, you know at uh, the uh, uh, house of commons level you know you constantly see that the uh, uk labor uh, uh, party will uh uh, 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 what's the word? They will. Uh, what's the word when they don't vote? Abstain. Abstain. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They constantly abstain because they don't want to vote against something that would uh, overtly attack devolution. But by the same token, they don't want to vote for something that overtly attacks unionism. Mm. Uh, you, you know the, the 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 integrity of the UK Union as they see it, yeah. uh, and that is the uh, rock and the hard place between the two. Now, conversely, when you've got uh, parties like the SNP, uh, uh, Plaid Cymru, uh, and to certain certain respects on the island of Ireland, you've got Sinn Fein, you know, who are overtly. Uh, 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 constantly campaigning for independence uh you, you know as it, it, it as clear as your nose on on your face uh you, you, you know and yet we've got to put up with uh the uh, fact that we're being decisive uh and uh, you, you know we should just sit in the corner and shut up and you know not make any noise mm -hmm. uh, and just accept what the overlords are doling out to us you know, as meekly as that. So, you know, I go back to my first point, and it is exactly what the Tories want. It is, it is uh, uh, more centralisation uh, and more uh, being able to uh, uh, be able to spend money where they want to bypass the Scottish Government and, you, you know, like build a wee bridge in somewhere, you, you, you know, uh, like... I'm, I'm, I'm just taking a, a village <laughs> off of the top of my head and click manning, right? They want to build a wee bridge. Oh, there we go. We'll give you a hundred thousand pound in order to do that. Aren't the Tories benevolent? Mm. But that would have happened anyway under the Scottish government had you just sent the money to Edinburgh and we yeah. would have, you, you know, turned out, you, you know, and this is what they've got. This is the last thing that they've got uh, in order to purport the fact that the uh, wide shoulders of the UK supports everyone, where in actual fact, it doesn't. Drew Henry highlighted it 
eloquently uh, by citing the fact that Boris Johnson himself, going back to a pound spent in Croydon is better than a pound spent in Strathclyde. That tells you everything you want to know about, you know, what the Tories think of devolution. Mm. Well, we move on to another Brexit story now and measures to protect medical supplies from the disruption of Brexit have been put in place as part of plans for the end of the transition period. Intensified preparations will protect patients and supplies during the concurrent challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, winter weather and Brexit. A national stockpile of around 60 critical care and supportive care or end-of-life medicines is being built and additional freight capacity has been contracted to ensure critical goods can reach the UK mainland without interruption. The supply of medical devices and clinical consumables is being managed by National Services Scotland, which has been building up stocks at the National Distribution Centre. Pharmaceutical companies have also been building up stocks of medicines to mitigate for potential disruption at ports. The clinically-led Scottish Medicines Shortages Response Group will also draw up mitigation recommendations for the NHS as needed. As well as utilising the Scottish Government Resilience Room arrangements, Police Scotland will also begin a phased activation of the National Coordination Centre and a single Scotland-wide multi-agency coordination centre as well. So, Day, um, I mean, it is comforting, I suppose, that the, the Scottish Government has made some preparations to ensure that certain drugs won't, uh, won't just vanish at the beginning of January, but it's still quite a concern that we have to be thinking about uh, drug shortages uh, in just a matter yeah. of weeks. Yes, yes. It's, it's called forward planning, and uh, certainly it is comforting that Scottish Government do appear to have been forward planning. However, um, I, I read or um, I saw somewhere that, um, that, you know, the lorry park down in Kent, which is mm. supposed to be built for all the, our lorries going over and, and what have you, apparently 75% of the lorry fleet um, are in Europe. They're not in this country. Mm. So, What's that lorry park for? Mm. You know, once once the deadline closes, that's it. Anything that's over in Europe, and most of them have gone back to Europe, are preparing to go back to Europe before the 1st of January. So most of the lorries are going to be back in Europe, and we're going to be isolated with whatever stocks we've got here. Um, and, you know, it just seems to me to be that we're stuck. Yeah, yeah, we will obviously keep an eye on that whole uh, situation as it develops towards the end of this year. But plans for the 2021 exam diet have been updated in light of continuing disruption to young people's education caused by the coronavirus. Higher and advanced higher exams will now not go ahead and will be replaced with awards based on teacher judgment of evidence of pupils' attainment. The assessment model will be based on the approach already agreed for National 5 awards, details of which were also set out today. Data shows that since the return to school in August, there have been varied instances of COVID-related disruption to learning, with a higher proportion of pupils from more deprived areas having to spend time out of school. So, Chris, um, this is, uh, I think, good news for a lot of people. This is something that a lot of educate people involved in education have been calling for for a while. Um, and hopefully this will take a wee bit of pressure off some of those fifth and sixth year pupils. Well, again, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the, uh, uh, the uh, pupils and the students, uh, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are directly affected by this. Uh, not just the teachers, uh, although, you know, from a trade union point of view, obviously I'm quite concerned about the teachers. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm heartened that, that the Scottish Government have got uh, a relatively good working relationship with the, uh, the uh, major teachers union, uh, the uh, EIS, uh, and uh, the uh, head of that, Larry Flanagan, uh, is always ready and willing to uh, uh, chip in his tuppence worth. Uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, 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 helpful and sometimes it's not. Uh, but, you, you know, by that same token, I think that everybody uh, in the round uh, recognises the fact that, you, you know, that the uh, students and the teachers 
you, you know, have to be, uh, you know, uh, deeply considered, uh, you, you know, uh, when we go forward, considering the uh, the uh, last uh, debacle uh, earlier on in the year, uh, where the Scottish government didn't exactly shroud itself in glory on that score. Uh, so, but I, I think now, uh, you, you know, you learn by trial and error. Uh, and I think now, you, you know, if we can move forward, uh, as uh, Dave was alluding to there, uh, you, you know, and I, uh, the uh, Scottish government being proactive, uh, but I would also point out that it's what you get with a government who, uh, you, you know, uh, do act in the best interests where possible uh, and uh, uh, like to uh, demonstrate the fact that they are acting with a bit of la uh, clarity and leadership, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously severely lacking from the uh, government at Westminster. Yeah, well, we move from high schools now to universities and universities will stagger the return of undergraduate students to campuses over at least six weeks within a package of measures to minimise the transmission of coronavirus. With only very limited exceptions, undergraduates should initially plan to restart their studies at home and only return to campuses and term time accommodation when notified to do so by their universities. When students return to term time accommodation, they will be offered lateral flow COVID-19 testing, similar to that offered ahead of the Christmas break. All students are being asked to restrict their social interaction for a fortnight before they return to university and for the same period after they get there. College students who largely do not move away from home to go to education should return as planned in line with the protection level from the for the area that their college is in at the time. So day um there was quite a bit of criticism uh, of the the kind of rush to get everybody back to university as normal at the start of term, even when most classes were still being delivered remotely. Do you think the, the advice that's been set out here gets a bit of a better balance to, to getting the students back in? Yes, we're talking about the um, university students, uh -huh. yes. not the schools. Yes, that does make a lot more sense. Can, can I just quickly say, on the to go back to the schools, sure. I see this as an opportunity for us to do things slightly differently in education um, because students have been, or school pupils have been put under enormous pressures from the exam system. Um, despite curriculum for excellence, which is supposed to be child-centered, there's still enormous pressure, um, as has been witnessed by the huge furore that there was over the exam fiasco, as they called it, mm -hmm. from the opposition and parents and so on and so forth. I, I think we need to free up our teachers and our pupils um, to be able to use a more flexible way of learning um, that doesn't always have to be shoved through a mincer to come out with a very narrow outcome mm. in terms of exam results. So, sorry, just to, you know, have come back no, no. on that week. I see it as a as an opportunity rather than as as a challenge. Mm -hmm. And on the the subject of the, the universities, oh. are you you hopeful that this will be a a safer way that there will be a bit less of the the wee outbreaks that we saw in various uh, halls of residence and such like? Yeah, well, there's bound to be. I mean, it's it's like me if I, if I don't want my lambs to be catching a disease because one lamb has got it and you've piled them all in together, then the spread of the disease is going to be greater than if I gave them a bit more space and fewer numbers in mm. other compartments. So yes, it's common sense, isn't it? Yeah, we will obviously keep an eye on what happens with the universities. But we move on now and billionaire Jim Ratcliffe's Ineos will manufacture its first car in France after a deal to take over a site run by Germany's Daimler, ditching plans to build a factory in the UK. Prominent Brexit supporter Ratcliffe's petrochemicals company said in September of 2019 that it would build the Grenadier off-roader in Wales, creating up to 500 jobs, with a new plant in Portugal supplying the body and chassis. 
but in July it announced it was reviewing the investments due to the pandemic presenting opportunities in terms of existing manufacturing capacity that were not previously available to us. Today, Ineos confirmed it would take over Hambach, a Daimler facility close to the border with Germany. Hambach provided us with a unique opportunity that we simply could not ignore, to buy a modern automotive manufacturing facility with a world-class workforce, Ratcliffe, the Ineos Group chairman, said in a statement. So Chris, um, I suspect you are not uh, Jim Ratcliffe's biggest fan. What do you make of this decision to to move his car production to France rather than put it in Wales as he previously promised? Well, it's like, uh, uh, you're right, the fact that it, uh, he was scored off my Christmas list a long time ago, uh, you, you know, when I was sending cards. Uh, not that I give into to that uh, hmm. kind of corporate consumerism. Uh, but uh, I, 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 look, it was it was always going to go there. This is just a rerun of the guy that uh, the uh, Dyson bloke and stuff like that. You, you know, who back in two thousand and four uh, promised you the world and its oyster, uh, and you, you know, if only you voted for Brexit, uh, the the possibilities are limitless, endless, and insurmountable. Uh, and we'll be here to invest in Britain, you, you know, once we uh, leave the EU. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the very next day, he ships all his production, uh, you know, overseas. He uh, moves his headquarters uh, to a tax haven somewhere in Seychelles. Uh, and you see countless, countless uh, companies uh, who have gradually withdrawn from the UK uh you, you, you know uh, uh not just in production wise but uh, also in financial uh, terms as well uh and uh, and again it's you know as rats abandoning the sinking ship i don't have anything wrong in so far as you, you know a businessman comes across a business opportunity and sees that it's a perfect fit for him and stuff like that that is his right to do so and whatnot what have you but you you, you know uh, the uh, welsh people must be feeling very aggrieved obviously uh but uh, you, you know again we see this replicated we uh, we uh, will see it replicated with nissan uh, at sunderland uh you, you know and it's going to be represent uh, it's going to be replicated at the length and breadth of the country uh you, you, you know i could bring up uh, you know, all sorts of companies that have been promised the earth uh, under the uh, uh, UK administration and then been dropped like a hot potato when it doesn't suit them. Yeah. Uh, and of course, so, Chris, yeah. uh, we, we, we have yet to see the, the German car manufacturers run into the rescue of, of Britain in this negotiation as well, haven't we? They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do <laughs> it. Uh, I am, and, I am and, shocked by that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you, you know, and 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 again, this is where Britain sort of like punches itself in the face, time and time again, uh, with this exceptionalism that they are, you, you know, a force, you, you know, within the worldwide economy. Uh, if you look at the worldwide economy as just being one big pond, uh, Britain is just one of the fish that are in that. You, you know, and I, you know, and they're not even, you, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, perfectly oversized in any such way, shape, or form. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Britain is no longer. See, the, I, I, again, this is something that the the, the 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 Tories just don't understand. Britain is no longer an empire, and the UK is not a country. The UK is a conscript of four nations who, that make up a country. Mm -hmm. And when one nation rides roughshod over the other three, then obviously it's not going to run the way that it used to do. You, you, you know, and I'm talking mm -hmm. about back in the 50s, back in the 60s, back in the 70s. You, you know, I mean, back in the 50s, 60s and 70s, you, you know, because there was no political will within the devolved competencies, 
and we just accepted, you, 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 you know, that the UK were sort of like running the show uh, and we just had to put up with the best of the bad lot. Now, that you, you, you know, we are now saying, and Wales are gradually saying, and to a certain respect, Northern Ireland are now saying that this is not the way to go and we want a new model. I, 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 I was talking to a friend the other day there and, and, and I just happened to t throw in the fact that all throughout this Brexit calamity, we have not really heard about what's happening in uh, uh, Gibraltar. Uh, we're not really hearing an awful lot about what's happening uh, in, uh, uh, oh God, what's the other two principalities? The, the uh, Cyprus bases. No, well, well, not even just Cyprus, but even closer to home, Guernsey and, oh, yeah. uh, and other ones. You, 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 you know, it's not being reported. Uh, and yet, you, you know, them being autonomous to a certain degree of the uh, UK uh, uh, government, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're basically allowed to get on with, you, you know, what what they what they need to go on with and be completely autonomous now when i was having this conversation i also made the point and this is a very salient point that i think it's been missed by an awful lot of mps uh in uh, britain the canary islands are owned by the spanish and the spanish are in the eu but the canary islands are not mm -hmm. right so the likes of lanzarote ferro ventura las palmas and tenerife when they want to do something on their island, they don't go to Madrid and ask permission. They just do it. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's it, because they run their own economies. Yeah. Do you know, and this, this again goes back to what I was saying earlier on, is the fact that the Tories are, are deeply, deeply against any, any form of de uh, 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 devolution whatsoever. And their sole aim Throughout the whole of Brexit, their sole aim is centralisation. It's so that they can look after the southeast and bugger everyone else in the rest of the, the uh, country. Mm. Well, we cross the Atlantic now, and US President Donald Trump's ill-fated campaign to challenge and overturn the results of the November 3rd election face another hurdle today, thanks to the so-called safe harbour safe harbor provisions <clears throat> excuse me, of an 1887 law which was passed to avoid the kind of crisis Trump has been trying to provoke. Safe Harbour Day is a deadline for states to certify the results of the presidential election. Meeting the deadline is not mandatory, but it provides assurances that a state's results will not be second-guessed by Congress. The Safe Harbour date falls six days before the meeting of the Electoral College, in which slates of electors formally select the presidential nominee who won the popular vote in their home states. A candidate needs at least 270 electoral votes to capture the presidency. Biden has amassed 306 votes to Trump's 232. This year, Safe Harbour Day falls today. The day provides no formal assurances around Biden's election, but it does make it more likely that any legal challenges will fail, as judges may rule that it's too late to overturn results certified by Safe Harbor Day. Only Colorado, Hawaii and New Jersey had not formally certified their results by this afternoon, but none is necessary to take Biden over the winning line in the Electoral College. So, Day, we'll come to you first here. Um, do you think this uh, challenge that Trump has been trying to, to run... Do you think it is now running out of steam and we will see this kind of dissipate and eventually Trump will just leave the, the White House as expected? <laughs> well, it's, it certainly looks that way, but whether he'll just leave the White House um, as expected, I don't know. He'll, he'll continue to waffle and ruffle and blow and huff and puff um, and make as much difficulties uh, for the incoming president, Biden. Um, but yes, I mean, it is game over and it, it, he knows it. Um, but he's hanging on as long as he can because he knows, as do the rest of his dreadful family, that they could well be ending up in jail. When he said that, you know, Hillary Clinton he would jail her, I think he, we might find that the boot is on the other foot and mm -hmm. he could end up in jail because of the uh, 
um, corruption that has gone on with his family, making money out of um, you know all the properties that they have across the world um, mm. and, and so on. And Chris, to, to come to you just quickly on this one, um, do you have any worries that Donald Trump is is just going to hang around like a bad smell and just keep telling the, the American people for as long as it takes that Joe Biden is not legitimately elected, that he's not the rightful president of the United States? Does, does that, is that, and is that likely to cause a problem, do you think? I think... Uh... I think through time. Uh, I mean, I was I, I I was led to believe that other than Wisconsin, uh, I was led to believe that all the other states had actually uh, uh, met the deadline, uh, mm. uh, which was required in federal law. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, to uh, meet uh, Harbor Day, yeah. uh, and uh, so I mean, from you, you know that that point of view. Uh, he will, uh, uh, Trump will hang around like a bad smell uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, he will do anything to, I think, uh, uh, impede uh, the uh, smooth transition. There will be a transition to the Biden administration, uh, but it will be less than uh, harmonious as as uh, uh, previous transitions will be. Uh, because at the end of the day, Trump has still got uh, several legal litigations outstanding in various states. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you know, challenging, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, the accounts and stuff like that. That's for by what is actually happening at the electoral college. Yeah, uh, and uh, that actually, that actually seems to have missed. Donald Trump is, if, you know, I mean, an awful lot of the viewers won't understand what the Electoral College is. Uh, I don't purport to know 100% <laughs> about it myself, but I think I know a wee bit more than what Donald Trump knows <laughs> insofar as the Electoral College is pretty much, once that vote comes in, it's, in, it's, it's conclusive yeah. uh, and there is no challenge in it, and that's that. Uh, but yeah, he will he, he will be around, and I tell you why he'll be around, because I fully expect, uh, if not him, uh, I fully expect him to. Uh, I, I fully expect his family to be uh, the opposition challengers in four years' time, mm. uh, and uh, you, you know, so I see him building up an awful lot of uh, 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 media attention. Uh, there was rumours that he was going to uh, 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 build his own television network and all the rest of it. Obviously, it's not going to be as good as broadcast in Scotland. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, yeah, you know, well, uh, he will be ever present. That's for sure. Uh, he's not going away anytime soon. Yeah. Well, as we know, uh, we heard we've heard that Donald Trump has gone off Fox News in recent years. So, Mr. Trump. If you are looking for a new reliable news source, we're here waiting for you. Um, but finally tonight, families of children with a disability or long-term health condition living in Dundee City, Perth and Kinross or the Western Isles will be able to apply for the child disability payment from summer of 2021. This new benefit will be available across Scotland from autumn of 2021. The child disability payment will replace the disability living allowance for children, which is currently delivered through the Department for Work and Pensions. This new support is there for families applying for disability assistance for the first time. Families currently getting DLA for children from the Department for Work and Pensions will start to be transferred to the new Scottish system from next year. This is the second form of disability assistance to be delivered under the new Scottish Social Security system following the introduction of the Child Winter Heating Assistance Payment in November of this year. So, Chris, just very quickly, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but uh, this is welcome news. I mean, the DWP is not well regarded for its treatment of people applying for DLA. They're not, no. And just very, very quickly, uh, uh, they, 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 uh, it just shows you again that the, the uh, Scottish government are uh, capable of getting on with the day job. 
uh, and it gives uh, people an insight into how the Scottish Government are looking to transform the Social Security uh, 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 benefits, uh, you know, for the citizens of Scotland. So, you know, it's welcome news that they're actually rolling this out uh, three or four months earlier uh, than the the actual rollout of August. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think it's done with any sort of like favouritism in any such shape or form. They've just selected, uh, you know, a couple of regions in order to roll it out. Uh, and I think it's great. And, and again, it's testament to uh, a good collaboration uh, within the Scottish Government, uh, you, you know, with uh, uh, Shirley Ann Somerville and Claire uh, uh, Hawhey, uh, and actually sort of like uh, looking after uh, people that have got disabilities. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, it's obviously it's something that's got to be welcomed, Kenny. Mm. I'm really, really quite happy about this. Yeah. And if uh, if you think that this may be a benefit that you're eligible for, then you can find out more by going to the Social Security Scotland website. But that is just about all we have time for tonight. So I would like to thank very much Day Tucker and Chris McCusker for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have both of you on the show. So thank you very much for being here. And thank you to you at home as well. Uh, there would be no point in us making these shows if you weren't with us. So thank you very much for uh, spending that time with us. Uh, as many of you will know, we are conducting a fundraiser just now. We are trying to raise money to employ a full-time editor and some full-time journalists to help us develop into the kind of news broadcaster that Scotland needs and deserves. So if you're able to support us with that, please do go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash donate to make a one-off payment or slash register if you would like to sign up as a regular supporter. Uh, both are very, very welcome. If you're not able to support us financially, we absolutely understand and the shows will always be free to view online, but you can still help support us in a big way by uh, supporting us on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott. Like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then use those to share the shows around with your friends, your family, anyone else you happen to be talking to. Let them know why you support Broadcasting Scotland and why you think they should give us a try as well. Uh, word of mouth is by far the best way for us to spread the word about what Broadcasting Scotland does. So please help us out that way if you can. And finally, if you would like to get involved here, as I said, we are hoping to be employing some staff soon. But we can always use more volunteers as well, uh, especially until we're able to get those uh, those employees in place. So if you're interested in getting involved in broadcasting, now this doesn't matter where you are in Scotland, we, we want to hear from you. So if you'd like to do that, do please get in touch, whether it's behind the camera or in front of the camera, we have lots of opportunities. However, that is absolutely all we have time for tonight. So thank you once again today and to Chris. Uh, I will be back again tomorrow night at seven. Uh, but until then, have a great evening. Good night. The Catalans, the Basques, the Galicians in the, the Basque. share uh, numbers for Scotland at the moment, the SNP 46.4%.